Good evening uh, for our fourth and final instalment. Uh, friend who welcomes everyone. Uh, some of you may be looking at that title and perhaps especially the subtitle and thinking there's some kind of contradiction between the message last week and the lecture this week. Uh, you may have been here for week one where we explored a very safe uh, topic, Jesus as teacher, whose teaching changed the world. And then the second week we looked at Jesus as healer and how that was a pointer to the mending of all things. But if you were unfortunate enough to be here last week, you got Jesus as judge. And although, on the one hand, that is a happy topic because the promise is that God will bring justice and overthrow evil and tyranny, and my oh my, do we want that? But it is, of course, a negative topic because to the degree that we ourselves have participated in injustice and hatred, that's the degree to which we ourselves will deserve judgment. And so there is a tension. Um, some would even say a contradiction with today's theme. Because today we're going to be looking at the way Jesus wined and dined with those you might have thought were first in line for judgment, the sinners. And he was accused by those who despised him of being a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But this tension between last week and this week actually takes us to the heart of the Christian faith. So I'm pretty excited and a little daunted at the prospect of explaining how these things do fit together. What I can say by way of introduction is that I first learnt about this theme of Jesus as the friend of sinners the easy way, by meeting a Christian who embodied it. This woman, a volunteer teacher once a week at my high school. And this woman, Glenda Weldon, was a very open Christian, and I always like to take the mickey out of, make fun of Christians. And I would always ask her smart aleck questions to make her look silly. And this woman had brilliant, funny, intelligent, but never unkind answers. And I worked out pretty quickly, I couldn't outdo this teacher, which was most unusual. Then this woman did something extraordinary. She could tell that a few of us were maybe interested in the Christian faith. So she would put on these feasts at her home on Friday afternoons after school, and anyone was allowed to come. And the feasts involved hamburgers, milkshakes, and scones, which is like the British donut. And we thought, well, a free feed, nothing wrong with that. And we thought we could put up with a bit of Bible. And so we turned up at this woman's home, week after week. My mates and I, would gorge ourselves on the hamburgers, milkshakes, and scones. And then she would read to us episodes from the Gospels, much like Jeff uh, just did for us. And the thing I want to say is her hospitality, her meals, her generosity was the doorway into the Christian faith for me. And my best mate, who's in that picture, Ben, and a bunch of others. In fact, three of us from the one class ended up going into full-time Christian ministry, having never been inside a church before. This woman uh, died six years ago. I kept up, kept up with her uh, through all the years uh, since high school, and I was pleased to be able to introduce my whole family to her. But she died in 2017, and, and when she died, her family created a cookbook uh, to give out to everyone at the funeral. And I uh, had the privilege of leading this uh, funeral, and they wanted everyone to have uh, her cookbook because she was such a foodie. So much of her life was celebrating with humans around food. 
And uh, they, of course, gave her scone recipe. Uh, can you see what they called the scones? <laughs> Glenda's Salvation Scones. And uh, we can tell you they are gorgeous scones with uh, jam and cream. And uh, the Dixon household makes them once a year around the anniversary of her death. Anyway, Glenda put up with so much from us, uh, my mates and I. Uh, sometimes we turned up as 20 15 or 16 year olds, though she was expecting five or six. Sometimes she was expecting 20 and we didn't show at all. And we'd learn the next week that she'd made all the hamburgers, milkshakes and scones. We even stole from her. Not me personally, but one of my buddies stole her DVD player for drug money. She knew that we had done it, but she mentioned it just in passing as if she had just misplaced her DVD player. And if we hear where it might be, to let her know that would be fab. Here's really what I want to say, just by way of introduction. In those days, as I was wrestling with the Christian faith, I had no idea there was such a thing as a judgmental, bigoted Christian. Because my sample of one was pretty good. Glenda epitomized for me one of the most interesting and historically secure aspects of the historical Jesus. That Jesus was regarded as the friend of sinners who ate and drank with them. So I want to do a little bit of history in order to set up this theme so that we feel the shock that ancient people felt in uh, having Jesus come to their home or Jesus sitting down uh, for a meal. Sinners, just to give you a bit of sense of the status of sinners, uh, weren't all murderers or something like that. They were just the irreligious and immoral in a religious and moral society. They could just be people who withheld money from the poor. They would be regarded as sinners. They could be people who just avoided ever going to the synagogue. They would be regarded as sinners. And the interesting thing we know about from Jesus' first century context is that your physical contact with a sinner was heavily regulated. It was believed that to sit down with a sinner in some way infected you. We actually have some of the rules from Jesus' day. They've been preserved in a book called the Mishnah. And we have the specific rules around having a tax collector or sinner in your home. Uh, here is... The, the ancient rule. Concerning thieves who enter your house, only the place trodden by the feet of the thieves is unclean. And they render unclean in those rooms the foods and the liquids and the clay utensils which are open, but the couches and the seats and the clay utensils which are sealed with a tight seal are clean. Concerning tax collectors who enter your house, the whole house is unclean. The point, of course, is that tax collectors were worse than thieves. Sharing meals with sinners and tax collectors was regarded as a, an especially risky thing. Because um, quite unlike today, meals were kind of supercharged with a spiritual dimension, that to sit down and share food was actually to participate in their life. This is how ancients viewed uh, mealtime. Here's a very well-known professor uh, from Denver Seminary who wrote a whole book on this topic of the scandal of Jesus dining, explaining this context. Ancient Judaism viewed mealtimes as important occasions for drawing boundaries. Dining created an intimate setting in which one nurtured friendship with the right kind of people. Unclean people and objects constantly threatened 
to corrupt God's holy elect nation and individuals within it. Like literal physical disease, we may think of ritual impurity as contagious. Sinners were a contagion, and meals were a powerful carrier of the contagion. Now, when you know that, and you open these biographies we call the Gospels, Jesus' ministry of being the friend of the sinners just leaps out of the page, which is why secular scholars even are really puzzled by this dimension of Jesus' life. He regularly dined with sinners. There are so many texts, I'll just uh, throw a couple on the screen, from Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Matthew himself had Jesus over to his home when he was a tax collector and regarded as a sinner. We read, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees, the religious conservative leaders, saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? Jesus was at the home of a Pharisee named Simon, and a sinful woman comes and weeps at his feet. And the rumor starts to spread about Jesus in these words I've already quoted tonight. He is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, when I say that, it may sound like a really cool thing, but this was a stinging insult to level at Jesus. But Jesus made it part of his mission to find people you wouldn't expect him to dine with and invite himself over for a meal. And the passage Jeff read us is a perfect example of how deliberate this whole thing is in the ministry of the historical Jesus. Jesus is walking through Jericho and Jericho's chief tax collector, Zacchaeus, is there. You might be thinking, what's all this business about the tax collector? I mean, the people at the IRS seem positively lovely people. Um, but tax collectors um, were often incredibly uh, ruthless in the way they collected taxes, and they often became obscenely wealthy by extorting people through taxation. There are other reasons as well they weren't liked, but they, they, they often were powerful and dishonest and wealthy. And, and the thing is, Jesus spots him and says, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. I'm coming to your place today. And, and the thing that's worth noting is Zacchaeus wasn't a poor, stigmatized outcast even though he was short. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and had to climb the tree to see Jesus. No, he's a wealthy controller in that town. Sure, the religious folks didn't like him, but he had plenty of parties he could have gone to. Plenty of people trying to get near him to share in his wealth and get a better deal in their taxation and so on. I reckon we might have muttered like the people of Jericho did when Jesus said, Zacchaeus, it's your home I want to stay in today. And, and this is worth pondering. God doesn't just love the low, dejected, outcast sinners. He even loves the opulent and arrogant sinners. And here, Jesus goes out of his way to embody that divine love by becoming the friend of just those kinds of people. Despite the great risk it was to his own personal reputation as a rabbi. And he did it in order to save them. This is Jesus' own language. Don't think this is one of those things that, you know, fundamentalist Christians invented the whole idea of saving people, it's Jesus' own language. 
Because in response to Jesus' welcome of Zacchaeus, and the privilege of having Jesus in his home, Zacchaeus is transformed and he, he stands up and he says, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. It gives you an idea of how much money he actually had. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man, that's Jesus' way of referring to himself, came to seek and to save the lost. Very important to notice the order of events here. First, Christ seeks him out. Christ invites himself over to Zacchaeus' home, despite the risk to his reputation. What I'm saying is Christ makes the initiative. Christ shows the welcome, the grace. And in response to that grace, Zacchaeus is overwhelmed and has this lavish explanation of how he wants to make amends. Christ's love inspired Zacchaeus' transformation. For Jesus, it isn't sin that's contagious. It's his grace that is contagious and transforming and enlivening. And this point is put beautifully in a very nerdy quote from one of the leading historical Jesus scholars of the last 50 years, Ben F. Meyer, a Canadian, brilliant historian. And in his book, one of my favorite academic books on Jesus, The Aims of Jesus, Ben Meyer says this. It's slightly nerdy wording, but when you spot the theme, it is remarkable. The new thing in the act of Jesus was that he reversed the normal religious structure. He sought communion first, that is, communion with people first. Conversion second. His table fellowship with sinners implied no acceptance of their sins. But in a world in which sinners stood inescapably condemned, Jesus' openness to them was irresistible. Contact triggered repentance. Conversion flowered from communion. Nothing could have dramatized the free grace and the present realization of God's saving act more effectively than this unheard of initiative towards sinners. We know of no other figure in antiquity that acted like this. Bringing God's saving act into the present, as Professor Meyer puts it, is exactly what Jesus was doing in his own words. Before the the crowd that was upset that Jesus had gone to the home of Zacchaeus, Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. And he says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Being saved, by the way, isn't... Um, religious jargon for like being one of us. You know, you know how like there used to be a kind of Christian that would actually say, are you saved? Right? Have you ever met one of those? Are you saved? Like it's all like, are you one of us? It, it, it's almost, it sort of lost its meaning. But that cliche obscures the fact, originally it meant, are you rescued from the coming judgment? Have you already escaped the coming judgment? That's what saved means. It means saved from the judgment we talked about last week. See, Jesus' message wasn't that we are all fine just as we are. His message was that we are not fine. But God's love is wide enough for anyone who wants it. Anyone can have a seat at the table of Christ. 
The clearest evidence of how seriously Jesus took this is, of course, at the last meal he had. At the last meal he had, he spoke again of forgiving, of embracing people. But this time he makes clear that it will be through his death. He takes that cup of wine. Many of you will know this passage well. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus could sit down at the table with the worst sinner, offering them forgiveness because he knew he would bear their wrongdoing. He would bear their judgment. He came to seek and save the loss, ultimately through his death. When I was first learning about Christianity as a 16-year-old, I had no difficulty believing God and Christians loved me. Isn't that interesting? I, I, had, I had no idea that there was such a thing as a judgmental, bigoted Christian. I mean, I later learnt it when I started hanging out with Christians and going to church and all that. <laughs> Not this church, if only I'd come to this church. But at the time, no idea, because my big sample of one was this woman, and she was just the opposite. She put up with so much from us little sinners. I remember one night, we were at a drunken party, and one of my friends, Daniel, was particularly drunk, and begged us not to take him home to his dad, who was very strict. And I said, there's no way you come to my home in that state. And he was, it was terrible. I mean, he had, I'm sorry, he had vomited all over himself. It was unpleasant. And one of us had this idea. It's about 11.30 at night. Doesn't that teacher live just like 500 metres up the road? I'm embarrassed to say it now, but we thought... Let's take him there. We go up to her home. We knock on her door. It's nearly midnight. Turns out she was just finishing up a very posh dinner party. She sees us. She sees Daniel. She doesn't bat an eyelid. She invites us straight into her home. It's so interesting because she was always on at us about drinking. And she was a teetotaler, never touched alcohol in her life. So we knew what she thought of what we were up to. But weirdly, we thought she'd be really cool with us nonetheless. And we were right. She showed us straight in, past the guests, out to the back of the house. She races off to her son's uh, bedroom, gets some extra pyjamas, comes down and says, look, throw Daniel in the shower, clean him up, put him in these pyjamas, put him in the guest wing, and we'll just deal with it tomorrow. And that's what we did. We, we, we showered him, we put him in his jammies and left him. We come back the next morning. And there is Daniel at the kitchen table looking worse for wear. As Glenda is cooking up bacon and eggs and chatting like he was part of the family. When you have someone like that in your life. It is the easiest thing in the world to believe that God loves you, despite you. I knew I hadn't lived the Christian life, but I knew what Glenda was like and what her God was like too. She died six years ago, as I've said, and... Some of you, if you um, got the um, Doubter's Guide to Jesus book, will know that I dedicated that book to her because the book came out uh, just as she died. 
Uh, here's my little dedication to her. In memory of Glenda Natasha Weldon, who put up with this godless 16-year-old and his scoundrel mates every Friday afternoon after school as we ate her hamburgers and scones, debated her God and lost, listened to her read and explain the Gospels, took advantage of her generosity, caused her frequent headaches before eventually finding ourselves captivated by the story she told about the man from Nazareth. I know that many of you are already Christians, and I, I guess the lesson for us is, are we the friend of sinners? Do we convey the wideness of God's mercy? But I guess I want to say to those who aren't sure what to make of the Christian faith, you may not have someone like Glenda in your life, but you do have Jesus Christ to look at, whose life is beautifully explained in the Gospels, where we discover that, yes, he was a teacher whose teaching changed the world, and a healer whose healings pointed to the mending of all things. And yes, confrontingly, he was the judge who in fact said he would be in charge of the judgment. But in episode after episode, if you read those Gospels, you'll come across Jesus sitting down for a meal with those first in line for judgment. And then you'll read of his death and his resurrection which are the great invitation to his table, to salvation. To the friend of sinners. I'm very happy to take some questions now. Well, John, I think I speak for all of us when I said we'd rather uh, hear you go on uh, about Jesus, the friend of sinners. But here's one question that came that just struck me immediately. Um, it says this person puts this one. How do we square Jesus' friendship with sinners, with Paul and New Testament authors' admonitions not even to associate with certain sinners, such as 1 Corinthians 5? Um. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to set them alongside each other because as soon as Paul says that, he says, not for a moment, meaning the sinners of the world. I mean someone who's claiming to be a Christian and living an immoral life. Them. You seek to shame, to win them back to the right way. But Paul is adamant that we don't shun the sinners of the world. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating that um, often the church has got that completely back to front? Not always. I don't want to be too down on the church. Um, but sometimes the church has been like too casual with the rottenness in the church and oh so judgmental with the sin out there in the naughty world, right? But actually it's meant to be the reverse, according to Paul and according to Jesus. And of course, that famous saying of Jesus um, about the log in your eye, he said, why do you look at the speck in someone else's eye when there's a log in yours? So, so the wrongdoing of the Christian is meant to feel like a log in our eye and the wrongdoing of other people is meant to seem more like a speck by comparison because it's in my eye, it should feel like a log. So actually, um, Paul and Jesus are on exactly the same page. And we owe, humanly speaking, we owe so much to the Apostle Paul for breaking through and bringing this grace and this, this ministry of meals to the non-Jewish population of the Roman world. See, almost all of Jesus' ministry was to people within the Jewish culture. 
Um, and the sinners we meet are sinners who are nonetheless Jewish sinners in his context. But Paul took this theme and ran with it off to Syria and Turkey and Greece to include and invite everyone. So, same, same. Questions in the room? I've got a list here on the phone, but other questions in the room? There's one there. Um, I, my question is, um, obviously I'm not Jesus, so I don't respond <laughs> perfectly, but when there are people close to you that are maybe living a life that's not how you would have want them to live it, or uh, they're in a relationship that is uh, detrimental to themselves and to their Christian faith, how, <laughs> how do you reconcile those, or how do you welcome the sinner mm -hmm. into your home, whether it's family mm -hmm. or someone else? Mm -hmm. Look, it is a very difficult and um, it, it will be dependent on the context. Um, but I think it's important that we air our views, that don't confuse what I'm saying with not making any discernments or judgments about wrong behavior, because Jesus is doing it all the time. And yet he sits down at the meal with sinners. So I'm of a view in, the, in that sort of interpersonal setting um, to graciously, gently, but firmly explain your view, your point of view, how you feel about a certain situation, ha have it out with, in, with clarity and kindness. But then when it is crystal clear what, what your view is and they still reject your account of the good, I think you shower love on them. And in a sense, it's your love, even though they know what you actually think about their behavior, that will be powerful. And, 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 and as soon as I say that, I'm, I'm thinking of Glenda, actually. I'm thinking of, like, I knew what she thought of the antics we got up to as 16-year-olds. Um, and, and, and when she just showed such kindness to us, actually the kindness scorched. Yeah, it made me actually feel even... It caused me to ponder my behaviour in the light of her grace toward me. As I say, it will be dependent on the situation, but, but that's the sort of the broad brush approach. Clarity and then a social kindness and, and, and largeness. Yeah. John, here's one from a texter. It's specifically about the Zacchaeus story. How is it that Jesus says salvation has come to this house when Zacchaeus only has offered external, albeit extreme, generosity? We don't see that he believes in Jesus as Lord and Savior. He just only accepts his friendship. Well, we only have um, 200 words <laughs> for the whole story. And, and the whole story took, you know, half a day. So I think we are just meant to assume that all, all the things that are necessary were bundled into that conversation. Um, but... It's clear in the text that Jesus makes the first move. I must come to your house today. And it's out of that sense of, wow, he's accepted me, that Zacchaeus has this transformation. And I think the transformation shouldn't be misread as him trying to earn his way into heaven or anything like that. It's, it's his response to the kindness he's been shown. Questions from the room? Fire away if you have them. This question, this texter said, how do I tell my friends when they say your God allows horrible things to happen? I won't speak for John. If he wants to answer it, he can, but I would refer you to the last two weeks uh, on the healer who mends everything and the judge because that's essentially what you dealt with. But Yes, I would point you to those last two talks um, because I, to, give a, to give a three minute answer, I feel is to diminish what is a profoundly important question. But I spent um, a long time explaining uh, how I would answer that in the last two talks. In the middle of the room, the hand there. Come on, guys, pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
John, you've already, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, touched on a response to one question about um, the LGTB community challenge. Do you have any encouragement for the church as a whole to be friends of sinners? Because sometimes culturally and preconceived conceptions are, they, it's hard to even offer friendship because if they know what you stand for, they automatically assume the bigoted and there's this wall. Yeah. And I'm finding some progress in that wall, but do you have anything broader to address yeah. the challenges we face? Mm -hmm. I think it's difficult for Christians to um, hear themselves or hear how they come across when, when they explain their classical view on sex, okay, the, the classical Christian view on sex, that sex only has God's pleasure and blessing in the context of a man and a woman in a lifelong commitment. That's the clear teaching of Scripture. Um, I hold it. Um, but how we often come across is that we think you're a lesser human being because you don't live that way or think that way. Um, and it is partly our fault. Now, it's partly the fault of the media, yes, okay, because the media actually is constantly talking about, or certain kind of media, is talking about how the church hates the LGBTQ community. And the LGBTQ community hears that repeatedly. And so they are hypersensitive, understandably, to any careless word from, from a Christian that feeds into this whole narrative that they've been told, Christians hate you. Christians think you're lesser of a human being. So, so what I'm saying to, to you if you're a Christian and you hold the classical Christian view of sex is we are working from way back on the communication front and, and we have to work incredibly hard to convey grace in the midst of disagreement. And so what I will often do, almost every time, when, I, when this... Uh, comes up I, either from a gay person or from someone who's like an ally with gay people and a, offended by a conservative Christian, the first thing I will say is that I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the way the church has spoken about and to and acted toward gay people. And that's not just a rhetorical ploy. I am sorry. I'm ashamed for how the church has sometimes mistreated gay people. Hopefully they hear that as sincere. And if they still want to continue the conversation, I'll say, look, do you think it's possible for two humans to profoundly disagree on such an important topic as sexual intimacy and still get along respectfully? Can we profoundly disagree and profoundly care at the same time? Is that possible in your mind? And I have found that most people who are on the other side of this question will say, yes, it must be possible. At which point I'll say, I hope we can do that together. You think I'm immoral for holding this view of what good sex is. And I would love to think you could show me care and kindness and respect despite n believing that I'm in the wrong. And I would love to think that the church and I would be able to be like that too, have a profound disagreement with you on sexual intimacy and yet have friendship and care. After all, Jesus was the master of flexing the muscle of conviction about what is true and good, and the muscle of compassion toward all, no matter whether they agreed with him or not. You just read the Gospels. He's got convictions. He preaches about sex and judgment and honesty and all the other things, but he sat down at the dinner table with people who were on the other side of those questions. Conviction and compassion. And it is true, the church has sometimes been all conviction and no compassion. 
It's equally true sometimes, particularly in the modern church, they're all compassion and no conviction. Both are departures from the real Jesus. So let's do both. I think you just invented a little move. Let's do that together. Ready? <laughs> Excellent. Well done. Thanks. I thought it was a profound point, but clearly it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was profound. <laughs> I had a question. What about the statement of Jesus says, cast not your pearls before swine yeah. in relation to this whole episode? Like, are we supposed to be careful who we... Um, preach to or whatever? Yeah. So, um, not in advance of preaching, because clearly the ministry of Jesus is like, Zacchaeus, you're a rotten sinner. I'm coming to your house. So, obviously, it's, it doesn't apply straight up. But I think, I think the point is, there will be times when you have attempted to show grace and so on, um, and uh, you, you, you will just need to withdraw and, and, and move on to the next person. Um, so, the, the reality is, you can be the most gentle, gracious, conviction, compassion Christian and still be absolutely hated by people who just are opposed to the Christian faith or the Christian view of, say, sex or, or money or whatever, right? Um, and, and there are times when, when you're pretty sure it's not because you've been a jerk, like you've really tried to do what Jesus did, but you're absolutely rejected, and I think you shouldn't feel the obligation to just hang in there. Pearls before swine. Yeah. Well, you're making your way over there. Uh, quick question here. Uh, I've got a friend. There's two questions related to the same issue. Friends who say, yes, I'm a Christian, and Jesus accepts me just the way that I am, presumably uh, not living in line with uh, but just saying, yes, of course, I'm a Christian, but and he accepts me, so why, why can't you? Yeah. Well, I mean, Jesus loved us too much to just leave us how we are. Um, you know, a parent um, loves their children enough simultaneously to embrace and protect and care for them and seek for their transformation toward the good. Uh, a parent who uh, just accepts and doesn't guide or seek to um, see them improve in the good uh, is is not loving. I mean, it's a it's a shallow form of love that leaves us as we are in all our foolishness and so on. So you look at the life of Jesus, and he we're trying to hold these things together. Um, he really spoke about, let's just take it away from sex and, 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 and think about money. He really said that you've got to be generous toward the poor. Because if you don't have a heart that's generous to the poor, you probably haven't experienced the mercy of God. That's how serious it is. Okay. So he calls Zacchaeus to salvation and forgiveness. But in the light of what Jesus has been saying in Luke's gospel, Luke knows, uh, sorry, Zacchaeus knows full well the implications of having received the mercy of Christ. The implication is I need to show practical mercy to others. So Jesus loves us too much to leave us as we are. That's a shallow love. Hey, John. Um, what do we do with uh, the people who never met Jesus' friend, um, like they never had a Glenda, or the millions of people who pre-existed Jesus or even Judaism um, who are only going to meet him when he comes back and he'll come back as judge, not as friend. Um, your question was phrased as what do we do with them? I, I assume you mean how do we think about those who have never heard about Christianity? What's the kind of right way to think about it? Um, man, this does, I mean, it's an awesome question and it deserves a whole, um, a whole talk. Or, or a whole chapter in one of my books. Um, it is a chapter in one of my books, but... Um, <laughs> um, and I'll, you know, maybe if you come up to me afterwards, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot it to you. Um, uh, but, but let me say a few things about, about, this, about this difficult question. Um, 
There are some things I don't believe about this question. Um, I don't think anyone will be judged, condemned, for having not heard about Jesus. That would be silly. So think of the person who's never heard anything about Jesus Christ. There's no way God's going to judge them for not having heard about Jesus Christ. Now, how could God do that? How dare you not have heard of Jesus Christ when they'd never heard of Jesus Christ? Like, so that can't be a criterion of judgment. Not hearing about Jesus Christ is not a sin. Okay, another thing I don't believe. I don't believe mere sincerity is the right criterion either. Because some people say, oh, but, you know, the person who's in, you know, in medieval Africa or whatever, if they were sincere, God will accept them because of their sincerity. To my mind, that, that's got too many problems. Um, because what do you do with a sincere Hamas fighter? I mean, for Hamas, they are actually participating in a religious duty zealously. Should God accept them for their sincerity? Or even to take it out of this week's catastrophe, uh, what about the um, worshipper of Molech in 6th century Judea who sacrificed children to, to the god, Molech? Does their sincerity save them? So I don't think sincerity is a, is a criterion. So what do I think the criterion is? I think the criterion is what did people do? How did they respond to what they really did know? of the truth. And I think everybody that's ever existed has known there is a universal mind, spirit, creator behind the universe, worthy of reverence, and that other human beings call out for our compassion. And I do think that's the criterion of judgment, and that will be absolutely fair. So no one's going to be condemned on Judgment Day for not having heard about Jesus. No one's going to be safe simply because they were sincere in their misguided religious perspective. But it would be entirely fair, wouldn't it, for God to ask the question, how did you respond to what you knew? Hypothetically, if there is such a person who did failingly respond with love for God and love for humans as their faith response, I can say in theory that I'd love to think God would have mercy on that person. It wouldn't be their good works that saved them. It would be Christ's death, even if they didn't know about it. That's the theory. The problem with my theory is how confident am I that humans left to themselves actually do that? All I know is that whether or not people have heard of Jesus, God will judge them on the basis of what they did with what they knew, and they knew God was there and other human beings were there. And that will be utterly fair. And I'll say one last thing. I do think it is right for Christians to hope that God's mercy extends beyond those who have named Jesus Lord. It's, 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 it's a right instinct, right? To hope that it is so. Because it would be ridiculous and scandalous and disgusting if a Christian was actually hoping it wasn't the case. <laughs> what, per, what kind of person who knows the mercy of God wouldn't want that mercy to just overflow? Okay, so, so it's right, that instinct is right, but I, but I equally have to hold this intention with the fact that it is not right to think God is obliged to have mercy on such a person. Because it's mercy. And by definition, we don't deserve it. So. But I have a whole chapter on it that I'll, I'll get to you. Right in the middle here. I hear a lot of things. Um, God rules heaven and earth. And then at the same time, I hear other people say, no, when something goes wrong or something, 
something as catastrophic as what's happening in the Middle East right now with Israel and Hamas. No, that's the devil. The devil is causing this on earth. My interpretation is um, God doesn't cause things to happen on earth. The devil doesn't cause things to happen on earth. It's humans that cause things that happen on earth. And you as a human being, how you deal with that is how you're going to be judged by God after life. If you deal things with compassion, you follow the teachings of the Bible and do things, do things, with, how would God do that? What, judging from what's in the Bible, how would Jesus and how would God uh, handle the situation that you're in? And you try to do the best thing you can according to the teachings of the Bible. But all this on earth is caused by man, not by God and by the devil. Am I wrong? Um, there's so much that's right in what you say. Um, just one thing makes me slightly nervous in what you say. Um, and that is, I'd hate to have given the impression, um, and I'd hate for anyone to leave here thinking that if you just try your best to follow the biblical ethics, you'll be fine. Because the, the very heart of Jesus' teaching wasn't, you know, be nice to people and be compassionate. The heart of his teaching was, you need my mercy. <laughs> he's dying for your forgiveness. So if what you mean is, knowing that I don't deserve heaven from God, knowing that I don't deserve to escape his judgment, that I plead God to have mercy on me, and out of that, I then try and do the things that he wants me to do, if that's what you're saying, yes, absolutely. That's, that sounds like the Christian life to me. But anyone who thinks, and I can't read your mind so I don't know, but anyone who thinks, if I do this, 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 and this, and this, then I will be deserving of God's kingdom. Um, Jesus so taught against that, that I, you know, I think it's a risk to leave here thinking that you'll be fine, just relying on your goodness. It's the mercy of God above all things, for which Jesus died. And out of that mercy, to live the life of compassion and mercy. And so if that's where you're going, that comment, I totally agree. Thank you. I've always wondered, Rahab saved the spies that were reconnoitering what was happening in Jericho. And somewhere it says that all of her, because of that, all of her family will be saved. And so I'm wondering about my family. Will they all be saved even though some of them are not believers? Um, I think it's uh, right to hope that they are and not right to think that they will be or that God is obliged to just because, uh, just because you're a Christian. No, I think it's pretty clear if you just read the Gospels that Jesus called everyone to come and uh, depend on him for mercy. And so I don't want to blunt the teachings of Jesus by giving free passes to people because, uh, because they're connected to a fine gentleman like yourself. Got one more over here. It's okay. Um, uh, how would you talk to a person who has a real dicey view of truth? In other words, um, they don't really believe in truth, sort of like Pontius Pilate. How would you talk to a person who believes that their inner feelings are more important? Um, Again, this is one of those things that deserves a whole talk. Um, what I find often, and I, I don't know if this is going to be true of the, of the person you have in mind, 
that people say things like that, but they don't actually live like it. They do actually believe things are true. Um, because, you know, if the person at the um, supermarket uh, gives them $5 less change than, than, they, than they deserve, they suddenly become very objective about the truth, don't they? Um, they, you know, the person who, who says, um, you know, the, 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 the cashier says, oh, no, but I feel like I've, I, I've given you what, what, what you need. It's my truth. Now, suddenly, your friend on the other side of the cashier is going, no, but it's true. Like, I gave you 20. It cost me 15. You've got to give me five. No, 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 I just... I'm not feeling it, right? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> it's, it is true that our world has become far more emphatic about feelings, but I often wonder whether that's actually a bit of cover for like just getting passionate about what we actually regard as true. We actually still regard things as true and false. And it's very easy with, by just asking questions like I've just asked f to uncover that, that they do. Um, you, you said that's the last question, so let me have the last word and simply say, um, you might be sitting there thinking, well, okay, so what would I, what would I do in response to this? I, I, I love the idea. I didn't know you were, gonna, uh, you were offering this Simply Christianity course. I wrote this uh, just to introduce people who don't believe uh, to the Christian faith. And so um, it's fantastic that you're doing this. So if you've, if you've got that little flyer, um, sign up for that. But I also thought, and I've long thought, that Jesus gave the perfect prayer for anyone who wants to become a Christian. It coincides with the only prayer he actually taught as well. It's the Lord's Prayer. If you think of the Lord's Prayer, these are words from Jesus given to us to say to God. And if you think about what he gave to us to say, these aren't just the words of the Christian. These are actually a wonderful doorway into becoming a Christian because you open your mouth to God and you say, Father, you are asking for a relationship with God right there. Hallowed be your name. You're, you're submitting to the greatness of God's name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the whole teaching of Jesus about the kingdom. Give us today our daily bread. You're expressing dependence on God. And forgive us our sins. You're asking for the mercy for which Christ died as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil is just asking for God's protection and guidance. And then it ends with those classic words that just give God praise. I, I just, what I'm saying is, I think we should end the doubter's guide to Jesus with this prayer. And, and even if you don't feel like praying it, um, find it. It's very easy to find on the internet. Just type the Lord's Prayer <laughs> and get alone and say it yourself. But I'm going to close uh, this series by praying it. And I'm not even going to ask you to say it out loud. Let me pray it on behalf of you. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.